Hi there, Tor Lacey here. This is a lecture about earthquakes. Our main learning objectives include be able to explain how elastic rebound generates earthquakes, be able to discuss the relationship between earthquakes and plate boundaries, understand how seismogram records are used to locate the epicenter and calculate the magnitude of earthquakes, and become familiar with historically impactful earthquakes. An earthquake could be defined as the vibration of the ground from waves of energy released when a fault breaks. Faults form where stresses acting on the crest cause brittle deformation. Typically, movement along these fractures happens intermittently in sudden bursts, which might be separated by hundreds or even thousands of years. Faults break or rupture when the pent-up strain in the rocks on either side of the fault overcomes the frictional resistance that was preventing movement along the fault. This allows the elastically strained rock on either side to slip and snap back into position, and through doing so, the stored energy is released as seismic waves, which travel outward in all directions from the focus. The focus, also called the hypocenter, is where the fault first ruptures. The location on Earth's surface directly above the focus is the epicenter. The epicenter is a more useful way to refer to the origin of the earthquake since it's on the surface and therefore can be plotted on a map. Making an earthquake summarized. First, tectonic stresses cause brittle deformation of the crust. Friction along the fault leads to a buildup of elastic strain. Strain accumulates until the friction is overcome and the fault breaks. The fault breaks at the focus and from there the crust snaps back into position through the process of elastic rebound releasing the seismic waves. The locations of earthquake epicenters create linear patterns when plotted on a map of Earth's surface. Earthquakes can happen any place on Earth where stresses are acting on the crust, but especially along plate boundaries, as we see by the pattern made by epicenter locations. The pattern isn't perfect, however, because earthquakes can happen away from plate boundaries as well, although these happen less frequently. As you may know from experience, when we have an earthquake, reporters will usually talk about the epicenter of the earthquake. But how do we know where this was? Is this something that can be directly observed? Is there some sort of physical evidence on the ground telling us where the epicenter was? No, not necessarily. Instead, we need to, in a sense, work backwards from where the shaking was recorded to where the shaking came from. This is part of the art of seismology. In order to do this, seismologists, geologists who specialize in the study of earthquakes, use a tool called a seismometer. As seismic waves pass through the ground supporting the seismometer, the machine moves with the ground recording the shaking. The more intense the energy passing through, the greater the shaking, which will be reflected in the seismogram, the record of the earthquake as recorded by the seismograph. This is an example of a typical seismogram recording, which reveals that not all seismic waves are the same. The energy produced by an earthquake moves in different ways and at different velocities. Primary or P waves travel the fastest and therefore arrive in a seismograph first. P waves typically cause the least shaking, which is reflected in their lowest amplitudes. The secondary, or S waves, arrive at the seismograph second because they are slower. They shake the ground horizontally in a side-to-side -side motion and typically have moderate amplitudes. Surface waves arrive last as they are the slowest, but have the greatest amplitudes and therefore can be the most damaging to structures. They move the ground with a shaking motion or a rolling motion and therefore have two names, L waves for love waves 
and R waves for Rayleigh waves. For locating the epicenter of an earthquake, we utilize the fact that P and S waves travel at different but constant velocities. As an analogy, imagine you were always driving 100 miles per hour and your friend always 50 miles per hour. If you arrive at a destination one hour before your friend, how far have you driven? 100 miles, because at 100 miles, your friend has only traveled 50 miles and will need one more hour to travel the next 50 miles of this 100 mile trip. The difference in arrival time between you and your friend, or in the case of seismology, the P wave and the S wave is called the lag time. By studying a seismogram, the lag time is easily measured and is what is used by geologists to determine the distance the seismograph is from the epicenter of the earthquake. First off, we need to consider the scale of the seismogram, then measure the distance between the first P wave and the arrival of the first S wave. This gives us the difference in arrival time between these two waves at the seismograph and our lag time. The lag time is then plotted on a travel time curve for the velocities of seismic waves as a function of lag time and distance to the epicenter. A travel time graph gives us a distance to the epicenter based on the difference in arrival times or lag time of the P and S waves at a seismograph. The travel time graph gives the distance to the epicenter of the earthquake, but not a direction to the epicenter. In order to pinpoint the location of the epicenter, a compass is used to draw a circle around the position of the seismograph with a radius equal to the distance to the epicenter. In this way, all possible directions are accounted for. When this is done for three or more seismograph localities, a process called triangulating, the circles will intersect at a point representing the epicenter. Measuring earthquake intensity. The Richter magnitude scale is probably the most well-known technique for measuring earthquakes. It uses the seismogram record to quickly measure the intensity or magnitude of shaking. A more accurate measure for earthquake intensity, especially for larger quakes, is the moment magnitude scale. With more accuracy comes more measurements and complex calculations than the Richter scale, making a magnitude calculation more time consuming. Consequently, earthquakes are typically reported to the public based on a quick estimate of magnitude using the Richter scale. Earthquake destruction. The amount of damage caused by an earthquake at a particular location depends on several factors. The intensity of the shaking, the greater the magnitude of the seismic waves, the more intense the shaking will be. The proximity of the location relative to the focus and epicenter. Seismic waves weaken with distance, so the closer, the more intense the shaking will be. The geologic conditions at the location. Loose sediment will experience more intense shaking than solid bedrock, and shallow groundwater can lead to liquefaction. And the material and design of buildings and other structures. In Haiti, for example, Poorly constructed buildings caused the deaths of tens of thousands of people when they collapsed. Liquefaction happens where there is loose, porous sediment and a shallow groundwater table. If the sediment is shaken with enough intensity, it compacts under its own weight, forcing the groundwater to the surface, which saturates and liquefies the sediment. This, in a sense, makes the sediment turn into quicksand. Tsunami. Tsunami are rare, but can be extraordinarily deadly and destructive. In Southeast Asia and Japan, hundreds of thousands of people were killed by tsunamis triggered by the 2005 Indonesia and 2011 Japan earthquakes. A tsunami wave can be triggered by the sudden offset of the seafloor due to fault movement which in turn disrupts the ocean surface, 
making a very long and fast moving wave. Because the wavelength is so long, a single wave contains a huge volume of water with huge mass and momentum that can easily destroy structures and kill people. That's it for this lecture on earthquakes. Thank you for listening.